Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. It is an absolute pleasure to be back in Montgomery. I could take my whole time this afternoon and may wind up doing that. Just telling stories about how much I enjoyed discovering Montgomery when I first came here and in it must be over a dozen visits since over the years in the process of doing research. A, uh, in my experience, a wonderfully welcoming and hospitable community. And good Lord, what fun I've had working in this building. It's just, I'm blown away having had a chance to see what's happened at the Alabama archives uh, since I was last here. When I first started working here back in the early 90s, Ed Bridges was here then, Ricky and Norwood were here there, and Bob. Uh, it was already a wonderful institution, one of the most enjoyable to work in in the country, for me. And uh, I've, I've been joking with my wife, Sandra, since we've been here, I've got to find another subject that I can write a book on that has Alabama in it, so I have an excuse to come back down here, because I want to have lunch in that patron's room over there. That, that is very, very nice. It's, it's, I'm delighted, and it's very kind of you all to ask me to come down here and speak on this. Um, I ought to have some trepidation, I suppose, coming to Montgomery to tell Montgomerians about some of your own history. But uh, fortunately, none of you are old enough to remember any of this firsthand. <coughs> and um, a few of you, perhaps, have lived blighted lives and have not had the opportunity to read the great book that I wrote on this subject. <laughs> so maybe I could tell you a few things that might be of interest about how Montgomery, almost overnight, now 150 years and just a few weeks ago, went from being a fairly sleepy southwestern rural state capital into becoming for a few months a point on the map of the world, a point where the, the attention of the entire western world was focused as Montgomery was a place that a new sort of experiment <coughs> was underway that might determine, was going to help determine the future course of America and whether it should be one or two Americas at that. I won't rehearse all of secession. You've been hearing a lot about that <coughs> uh, recently because we've been passing all these anniversaries. But I suppose for a start, it's you know, why, why Montgomery? Why did Montgomery become this, this focus all of a sudden? It's important to remember, and I don't think a lot of people do remember this, that uh, in, in the North, at the time, there was a notion of there being a, what they called a slave power conspiracy, that somehow the states that eventually seceded were all doing this in harmony, in concert with each other. It was all part of a concerted plan. And the fact is, it wasn't. They didn't just not get along with the North. They largely didn't get along with each other, either. Before Lincoln was elected, in November of 1861, uh, 60, <coughs> the governor of South Carolina, Governor William Gist, spelled G-I-S-T, but pronounced Gist. And I can tell you his politics, because he named one of his sons State Rights Gist. <laughs> so you know right away where he's coming from. He sent a form letter to all of the governors of the other slave states, asking them, if, as appears probable, Abraham Lincoln, a black Republican, in that term meaning black, meaning pro-Negro Republican, is elected president, will you secede? And every other governor who responded wrote back to him saying, no, unless South Carolina does first. Nobody wanted to be the first one to take that huge risk. And of course, South Carolina historically had been sort of the southern Massachusetts. You know, every, every fruitcake and nutcase there was in the South congregated to South Carolina just the way they all did to Massachusetts. There are people who would maintain this still goes on today. I, I take no sides in that. Well, of course, South Carolina does secede. And then very shortly, Mississippi and Florida, Louisiana, Alabama follow suit. But even though the South Carolinians, led by Robert Rhett, were very independent, and even though some of them were pretty out there, Still, even Rhett was smart enough to understand and to remember something that a Yankee had said 80-some years ago. If we do not hang together, we shall surely hang separately. Benjamin Franklin. So even though the South Carolinians are leery of jumping out of one confederation straight into another one, they knew that these seceded states were going to have to form some kind of mutual alliances for their mutual self-protection. And so he proposed 
the delegates from the states that were seceding and those that would secede in the future should gather in Montgomery because Montgomery at that time with six states seceded was roughly the geographical center. And also, of course, Montgomery was the home of William L. Yancey, who is Alabama's counterpart to Robert Redd, one of the, le the leading fire eaters. And it's important to note right now that, of course, the meeting does take place. Alabama chooses delegates to go to this meeting. It doesn't choose Yancey as one of them the leading citizen, the leading fire eater in, in Alabama. Because the instant these states secede, as is the case with revolutions worldwide, people realize we could, we've got to get out of the hands of the radicals now. The radicals bring on revolutions, but very quickly people move toward the center where there's strength. And, and Yancey was simply too radical. But other states <clears throat> agreed this is a good idea. To have this meeting in Montgomery, there was no plan. There was no mandate for what was to take place there. The states were simply to send delegates to talk, apparently, and then to come back and report to their separate uh, state conventions and or legislatures on what had been discussed by way of means for some kind of mutual protection and defense. In fact, Florida, at least, instructed its delegates that they were not to enter into any kind of new confederation. They were not authorized to do anything other than come and listen and then go home. So nobody knew what to expect would come out of this. <coughs> but on February 2nd, they started gathering here at Montgomery. They came in, by, came in by train. A few came in by steamboat. They're almost all politicians. So they all come with some idea in hand. Robert Rett will come armed with a constitution for a new confederation that he's drafted himself. He's not going to waste time letting anybody else have any say on this. He's going to tell the new confederation what its laws ought to be. And they come here to Montgomery, which then as now is an interesting town. <clears throat> I don't know the origin of this, but I found sources maintaining that the original name of the small community here was Yankee Town. Ain't that a great name for a future capital of the Confederacy? <laughs> it was a town with at least three and I think four flourishing theaters. It was a big theater town then, as it is now. The most popular actress in town was a lady who specialized in playing these sort of Scarlet O'Hara types with the vapors and all that, and her name was Margaret Mitchell. <clears throat> the, uh, the capital was supposedly erected on an eminence that was once known as Goat Hill, and which I don't know what that says about your legislators then or now. I leave that, leave that to you. All these people settle in, most of them staying at the Exchange Hotel, which of course is, is no longer here. And within the next few days, Montgomery will go from being a town of 8,000 people to almost 20,000. Because it's not just the delegates from these states who come to Montgomery. It's everything that follows people who are in politics or people who have power or people who may have power. Journalists from all over the north were here to watch what's going on. There's at least one journalist from London, England, representing the Times of London, who's come here to see what these people are going to do. The exchange is instantly overcrowded. It went from a normal custom of having one or two persons to a room to cramming them in six to a room, four to a bed. We have descriptions. Of course, that's politicians for you. We have descriptions of them four in a single bed, so they all have to lie in the same direction. When one turns, they all have to turn the opposite direction. They're like spoons are fitted into a drawer. The uh, landlord was profiteering like crazy with his captive audience, so he started cheapening down the quality of the food. They complained that the soup especially w was greasy and was making them flatulent. Well, when have you ever known a Congress that wasn't flatulent? <laughs> and already, while the meeting, the first meeting is supposed to convene in the State House on February 4th, two days beforehand, they're all, these men are already meeting informally in the saloons, and the bars and the pool rooms at the exchange and the other hotels, discussing informally, what are we here for? What are we going to do? And more importantly, beginning to jockey for position or for power or for influence on, to determine what actually is going to happen here. So even before the, the first, it first convenes on February 4th, already three plans have emerged. The South Carolina delegation led, he thinks, by Robert Barnwell Rett, 
wants to do as little as possible. And what comes from them is what they call the South Carolina plan, which is simply that we will, we will talk, we'll discuss some remedies, discuss some things we perhaps ought to think about doing, and adjourn, and go home and report to our conventions and our legislatures. The Mississippi delegation doesn't think that's enough. After all, they've got what Nathan Bedford Forrest called the bulge. They've got the bulge on the North and Lincoln, because Lincoln doesn't take office for a full month. So they've got the jump. And the Mississippi thinks we cannot waste all that time just talking and then going home to say what we talked about. So the Mississippians propose what we should do is discuss and come down with a firm plan, perhaps even a constitution. And the idea of, of perhaps this convention becoming a Congress or the election of a Congress to replace this convention. But that, and then report that back home. But that still wastes a lot of time. The Georgians, which are the powerhouse delegation, it's the biggest delegation there and it has truly the leading statesman in the entire South, the Robert Toombs, Alexander H. Stevens, who will become the Confederate Vice President, uh, Howell Cobb, Tom Cobb, a number of these other people. There's lots of Cobbs in Georgia. Uh, and they, they figure, we have to take the bull by the horns. We can't come and talk and leave it at that. They propose that with no authority whatever, and actually in direct violation of the instructions from Florida to its delegates, that they form themselves into a Congress, that they assume power to themselves that they don't have the right to assume, that they frame a constitution, elect a president, get a government up and operating, and then report that back to their states as a fait accompli and say, here it is. What they really propose is a revolution inside a revolution. And there's a lot of resistance to this, especially in South Carolina, because it's just too much. The South Carolinians are saying, my God, we just got out of one association that we decided was too limiting. Do we really want to go into another one? But the Georgians will hold sway, and indeed they'll be the most influential delegation all the time they're here. And all of this is essentially decided informally in the pool rooms and the saloons of, of the Exchange Hotel and elsewhere. So that by the February 4th, when everybody goes up the hill to the State House for the formal opening of the meeting, it's already pretty well decided what they're going to do. <coughs> There's a carnival atmosphere about all of this. This is the biggest thing that's ever happened in Montgomery. So you've got all these thousands of people, farmers from out in, in, the, in the hinterlands have come to Montgomery just to watch this show go on. Hucksters and vendors have shown up. They would at a state fair today to sell their wares to the delegates who are here and to the people who've come to see the delegates. It's sort of a, you know, a self-generating uh, uh, extravaganza. Not to mention, of course, all the journalists who are going to report and misreport all that is going on here. The local ladies of Montgomery actually put out tables with free food for the legislators in the state house as, as a means of welcoming them. You know, Montgomery hospitality goes back a long way. It didn't last very long because they discovered that it was a newspaper man who ate all the free food. And so they, they discontinued that. And everybody who can cram themselves into the state house does that morning, February 4th, to watch the great event. And what they see is all of these men, most of them politicians who know each other anyhow from previous days, greeting each other having a formal opening of their session, electing Howell Cobb president, not of the new nation, there isn't one yet, but president of this convention. And then they go into secret session and kick everybody out. And you never saw 20,000 so disappointed people in your life. They had come here for the big show of their lives, and they were being told, you can't watch. And if you think about it, I think you'll... And, th and these secret sessions will be protested for all the time Montgomery is the capital. But if you think about it, you can see the wisdom of it. <clears throat> You've just seen in these three plans I outlined that there's a wide variance of opinion even on what they ought to do, let alone how they're going to do it. If you are starting a revolution, part of your strength is to give to the outside world the picture of perfect unanimity. You can't afford to have the outside world seeing dissension in your own ranks. And there's a great deal of dissent. There will almost be, twice, there will almost be duels fought between delegates here at this convention because of the degree of disagreement between them. <clears throat>
How do you preserve this fiction of unanimity? You don't let anybody see what you're doing. And furthermore, one of the first things all delegates had to do was swear an oath not to talk to the press or to write letters or in any other way communicate to the outside what was going on in their sessions on pain of expulsion. And thankfully, at least a couple of men there were like politicians of all times and could not live up to an oath or keep their mouths shut. Otherwise, we wouldn't know what went on in some of these sessions. But Alexander Stevens every day wrote a letter to his brother Linton. Sometimes he wrote two letters a day. Robert Barnwell Rhett, who immediately thought everything had gone to hell because they weren't letting him run things, starts writing unsigned editorials back to his own newspaper, the Charleston Mercury in South Carolina. So thanks to them and a few others, we have at least a pretty good window into what was going on inside this convention. And they have to work fast. They've got one month. <clears throat> they create themselves a Congress, the beginning of their revolution. They decide they will be a single house, no house, no Senate. They're just is the provisional Congress. They need rules of order to operate under. So they have Alexander Stevens come up with rules of order. You want to put an audience to sleep, especially after lunch, start talking about parliamentary procedure. Having said that, I will now do so, <laughs> but only briefly. What, keep this in mind always, what's the overriding thing hanging over them? Time. They cannot waste time in parliamentary niceties. So they decide there are six states present. There will be a seventh when Texas arrives. They will be one state, one vote. Perfect equality among the states. Little Florida that has two, three delegates will have the same voting power as Georgia that has ten. Secondly, if there's a tie, which there can't be once there are seven states present, that issue is immediately defeated. They can't waste time on revotes on ties. Third, how do you determine who gets to vote for a state? You know what a quorum is. Georgia has 10 delegates. How many have to be present for their vote to count as the vote of that state? They can't waste time on not getting decisions. So one delegate present is a quorum, which means one of three delegates from Florida has just as much power as 10 delegates who are present from Georgia when it comes to a vote. And it will actually happen more than once, that only one delegate will be present to vote for a state, and that will decide an issue. Stevens and others form a committee to frame a provisional constitution, <coughs> which they do in just a few days. It's a bizarre document. It reminds me of the, the old Constitution of California when I lived out there. They never revised the Constitution. Just every law passed got added onto it. So it's this endless document, or was, with no organization. You can see the provisional con uh, constitution of the Confederacy today at the Museum of the Confederacy in Richmond. It's all one article, 18 feet long. I have actually measured it myself on the floor there. <coughs> they just threw everything into it because their plan was to have some immediate framework under which to operate while then taking more time to frame a more perfect constitution. That done, they have to choose who's their president. They're going to model their government, at least structurally, on that of the union they've just left. Interestingly, there had been very little politicking. First of all, nobody knew for sure what they were going to do when they got there. Secondly, everyone seems to have kind of assumed that Georgia would get to have the president. Georgia has the biggest delegation. Georgia has the most distinguished men there, especially Robert Toombs, who was a former U.S. senator from Georgia. And it's widely assumed, in fact, that Toombs will be the president. Unfortunately, Toombs has a problem. He, he's, he's a big, larger-than-life character, a hail fellow well-met, the master of the bon mot, the good word. Uh, people love to be around him. But his fatal flaw was that he could not handle alcohol. One or two glasses of wine or a couple of juleps would make him silly. And the night before they were to choose, to go into caucus to choose their presidents, the South Carolinians, causing trouble as always, hosted a, um, a party for the delegates at one of the other hotels, and Toombs had the fatal second glass of wine and apparently made an ass of himself. And these other men who were there watching this realized our president's going to be just like the president of the United States. He's not just our chief executive, he's our chief ambassador. 
he's going to meet and deal with heads of state from around the world. And these sorts of meetings usually involve convivial preprandials. How can we have a president who will make a fool of himself to other nations without making a fool of us to other nations as well? And so Toombs quite virtually drank himself out of the presidency. Suddenly there's this vacuum. People approach Alexander Stevens. Would he accept it if offered? He said, no. I was never part of the movement. He fought against secession in Georgia right up to the moment Georgia seceded. Nobody, even in the Georgia delegation, liked Howell Cobb. So, so the Georgians have all canceled themselves out, and suddenly there's this vacuum, and into the vacuum rides a man named Alexander Clayton, who's with the Mississippi delegation, with a letter <coughs> sometime before. Anticipating that there might be a new confederation framed, Clayton had written to Jefferson Davis saying, asking that if a new confederation was formed, would he accept the presidency? And Jefferson Davis wrote the perfect politician's reply. You know, I, I have no desire to do anything but stay home at Briarfield and tend my roses. You know, do da, do da. <clears throat> but should my country call, I cannot say no. In fact, I don't think Davis really wanted it. But he made it perfectly clear that he would not say no if it was offered. And into this vacuum, here comes Clayton with a letter from Davis saying he wouldn't say no. And Davis is the perfect man at the moment. He was never an ardent leader in the secession movement. He, stayed, he pretty much opposed secession almost up to the end. But he was never so pro-union that he ever argued against the right of secession or the possible need for it in some circumstances. He was neither too far to the left nor too far to the right. He was right in that center where revolutions gather the most strength. And, of course, he's the South's greatest living military hero as a result of his service in the war with Mexico. And some of these men actually envisioned that their commander-in-chief may fully, literally, exercise the duties of that office, including leading their armies in the field. So Davis, is, he's the ideal man. He's, and he is selected virtually unanimously. Uh, unanimously. Poor Bob Toombs was completely taken by surprise and was the most downfall of crest that man you ever saw. Uh, so they couldn't do anything for Toombs, but as a little sop to Georgia, which came with all the power and got nothing, they made Alexander Stevens vice president of the Confederacy. And within a few weeks, he would start spending the rest of his life essentially fighting with Jefferson Davis. Davis, of course, as you know, because this was just reenacted here a couple of months ago, is inaugurated. Uh, president on February 18th. There's a tremendous irony that he's inaugurated up on the State House steps with his back turned to a street that is still named Union Street to this day in Yankee Town. There's, there's a whole lot of delicious irony about this. But yet, that of course is when William Yancey, who's been left out of this whole event, says the man and the hour have met. Yancey will immediately become part of Davis's opposition and no doubt would have argued later that the man and the hour had missed. <laughs> First thing Davis has to do is form a, gov is form a government, a cabinet. They're, they have the United States as a model, as a template, but they have to do everything anew in a hurry and Davis will do most of it himself. There are currently seven states in the Confederacy and there are six cabinet posts, then of course there's the presidency, and Davis being from Missouri, uh, Mississippi has gotten the presidency. How do you suppose he decides who to put in the other six cabinet departments? Pure politics. Each state gets one. So what does it lead to? Robert Toombs, who didn't get to be president, is made Secretary of State, a job he turns down twice. And he once, by the way, almost fought a duel with Davis. Secretary of War, the next most important post, Alabama has got to get an important post. It's the host state. So he's persuaded to offer the post of Secretary of War to Leroy Pope Walker, a Huntsville lawyer whom Davis has never met and knows nothing about. They'll have a Navy. Not much of one, but they'll have a Navy. And they need somebody from a state that's got a lot of water around it, so what better than Florida? So Stephen Mallory, who is kind of a friend of Davis's, will be Secretary of the Navy. They need a Secretary of the Treasury. Well, poor South Carolina started all this mess and hasn't gotten anything yet, so he picks somebody from South Carolina, Christopher Meminger, whom he has never met. 
<coughs> Louisiana, yet pretty far down the totem pole, they have to have an attorney general who will never do much of anything. And that post goes to Judah P. Benjamin, a man with whom Davis once almost fought a duel. And finally, there has to be a postmaster general a job nobody would accept. He offered it to a Mississippian who turned it down. He offered it to somebody from, uh, from uh, Alabama who turned it down. It's, it, was a, it was a graveyard post even then. It hasn't gotten any better since. Fortunately, Texas came in then, and so Davis was able to offer it to a Texan, John H. Reagan, who was an old Indian fighter, who was an incredible guy, who finally said yes, and he at least knew Davis. So this is how the Confederate cabinet is composed. Two men Davis knew somewhat, two more he had never met, and two others whom he at once almost tried to kill in duels. This is a hell of a way to put together your government. But this is what politics and expedience and the pressures of time imposed on him. He then has to create an army. Remember, Lincoln's still not in office. The United States Army at this time numbers about 13,000 men scattered over frontier posts from Maine all the way to Southern California. There is no substantial Union Army. And Davis will issue calls to raise 100,000 men, and the volunteers start coming forward almost immediately. They've been, of course, <coughs> coming forward in South Carolina for months, ever since the uh, secession. So Davis actually, at this one point, by the end of February, uh, early March 1861, the Confederate Army will vastly outnumber the Union Army for the one and only time during the course of the war. They need money. They don't have any money. There's no taxation. They don't have any public lands to sell off. They have no source of income. And so the individual states will make outright gifts. Uh, Alabama will give, I think it's $250,000 as an outright gift to the Confederacy. Other states will follow suit. And they'll begin coming up with this, this arcane, yet somehow wonderfully imaginative system of expedience that the Confederacy will employ throughout the war for trying to fund its operations. <clears throat> Gifts, loans, printing treasury bills, etc. But the poor Confederate treasury, when Memminger went into operation on, uh, on Commerce Street, no, I'm sorry, it wasn't, it was on Dexter, which was called then Market, I think. Um, he, he, they turn over to the treasury this uh, cotton warehouse or old banking building that's vacant, but it has a vault. A vault nice big walk-in vault with a door that locked. For the first several weeks of the Confederate Treasury, the door is open. There's nothing in it to protect. Apparently, the first disbursement from the Confederate Treasury came from a man named H.D. Capers, who was Memminger's assistant secretary, which meant he stayed there, watched nothing going on, looked in the vault to see if anything miraculously appeared in it, and swept out. And a captain appeared with a company of local vol of company volunteers who had just arrived in Montgomery, and he said he needed some blankets, and as Capers described it, I had been out on a bender in town the night before, reached in my pocket and found $5, and I gave that to him to buy some blankets. That was the first disbursement of the Confederate Treasury. And he said he never got paid back. But, um, <clears throat> Davis has to try to come up with a foreign policy. It is hoped, and many believed, indeed many took it far too much for granted, that European nations, especially England, would grant diplomatic recognition to the Confederacy, which would lead to military aid and support, which would be enough to dissuade the North from trying to coerce the Southern states into coming back into the Union. So Davis has to set up a foreign policy, and he has to choose diplomats to send overseas. Here's what Rush and expedience forced him to do. The head of the diplomatic delegation is Alabama's William L. Yancey a man so radical his own state wouldn't make him a delegate to the Congress. This is not a diplomat. Pierre Rost from Louisiana, who spoke wonderful French but not very good English, so he got sent to England. <clears throat> Ambrose Dudley Mann, who spoke wonderful English and French and spent most of his life writing thinly veiled love letters to the wives of other men, and he gets sent to France which, of course, is a great place for a man with those, those proclivities. But then Davis doesn't give them authority to make decisions or do anything. They're simply sent over there to accept England and France, because France always would do what England did first, to accept their supplications to come sit at the feet of the Confederates, which, of course, they would never do. It was a diplomatic mission with no teeth. <clears throat> 
He'll send commissioners to Washington to try to negotiate for a peaceful separation to settle the differences between uh, North and South over, say, the federal property at Fort Sumter and that sort of thing. And, of course, they won't be received in Washington. And meanwhile, the, now that this is set up, I mean, Davis is working, I was telling Sandra today, no matter where he was in, in Montgomery, he was always in the office. He had an office in the White House. He had an office in the Exchange Hotel. He had an office in Government House, which is the building that no longer stands on Commerce, where all the government offices are. Where the White House used to be located, I figured once when he got up in the morning and shaved and looked out the window, he saw his office no matter where he looked. He was working constantly. He had to create a civil service. Well, going backing up, he had to, to get all of this done while Congress is now turning its attention to framing a permanent constitution. And here's what's interesting about what these men in Montgomery do. It's easy to dismiss them as radicals. Certainly many of them were radicals. It's easy to dismiss them as revolutionaries. Some definitely are extremists by almost any measure. But when they come here, they don't believe they're revolutionaries. They regard themselves as reformers. And you see it in what they do with their constitution. They borrow 95% of it verbatim from the old U.S. Constitution. But then, <clears throat> they put in their constitution a reform of the civil service to do away with the spoils system. So there will be the beginnings of a stable civil service that can survive changes in administrations over time. If you think term limits are a reform, of course, they give the Confederate president a single term, six years. If you think a presidential line item veto is a reform, their president gets it. No American president has had it except Bill Clinton for, I think, about two years during his uh, second term. The most ironic, I think, to me is they set about to abolish pork barrel legislation. I mean, the grandsons of these men will become the accomplished grand masters of pork barrel legislation in the 19th century and 20th century. They provide that Congress can generate no appropriations from within itself. All requests for appropriations must come through the executive. So it gives the executive some control over Congress's spending. They make it easier to remove their president through impeachment than it was under the U.S. Constitution. As I said, they give their president the line item veto and they make it easier to amend their constitution so that far from being hidebound people who think their, their constitution is set in stone, they're creating a document that's really organic, that is easy, that's more malleable, it's easier to change and adapt to changing circumstances than was the United States Constitution at that time. There is no question they firmly entrench slavery in their constitution. There are no Confederate territories as there were territories in the United States. But if there ever should be territories, they are all automatically with slavery. There will be no agitation over, over uh, slavery in the territories of the Confederacy. Furthermore, all territories that become states will automatically become slave states. They make it impossible, virtually, for a Confederate state to enact emancipation or abolition in its own limits without the permission of all the other states, which is hardly likely to happen. And they have a big debate over whether or not to allow free states to join their confederation. Some of these men actually believe that they're setting up the new city on a hill. That the old constitution was great, but it got perverted by the Union. And that not only would slave states want to secede and join their confederation, but perhaps more like-minded free states might as well. It was feared by some that the entire old Union might disintegrate and reform under this constitution. Jefferson Davis, this is not a joke, actually thought it was possible that New Hampshire might secede to join the Confederacy. He had been to New Hampshire. A college there gave them an honorary degree. They were good people. But what happens if you let free states join your Confederation? You let enough of them join, and they're a majority, and you've gone around a circle, and you're right back where you started again. This was called the Great Debate. And it's eventually what they wound up with, of course, was that free states could not join without the permission of all the other states. And a question that people very often ask me about the, the Confederate Constitution because they find it so surprising is, nowhere in the Constitution do they acknowledge the right of secession. They had a huge debate over it, and a heated debate. But they, some said, well, it's implicit. And if we explicitly state it in our Constitution, that could be interpreted to mean that it wasn't 
implicit before. But then there are others who say, if we do allow for secession in our constitution, then one day one of us may do to us what we just did to them. And so they decide simply to dodge the issue entirely. It'll take until March for this new constitution to be passed, and then the Congress will adjourn to go home and try to sell it to their states at home, (coughs) which very few regarded as a slam dunk. Most states will not take the risk, Georgia particularly, of even putting this new constitution to a general referendum of the population because they fear it will be voted down. The Confederate movement is not at all unlike the the movement during our revolution. It's It's a truism and it's not strictly accurate, but it's reasonable to say in the revolution that a third of the people supported it, a third were opposed to it, were loyalists, and the other third didn't care. It happened beyond their sight and they weren't affected by it. The Confederate movement is very much the same. There's tremendous opposition to it. Wherever the ground gets high, North Alabama, North Georgia, Western North Carolina, Southwest Missouri, uh, Southwest Virginia, wherever the altitude goes up and large plantation-based agriculture is not practical, adherence to the Confederate movement goes lower and lower or outright unionism prevailed. Alexander Stevens was terrified that Georgia might reject this new constitution, that Georgia was most responsible for. If that happened, where would they be? Think of the morale blow that would give throughout the rest of this new confederacy. So lobbyists from uh, Montgomery will go out along with these delegates to try to work as hard as they can to get the state conventions to adopt uh, this new constitution. Eventually they will, but it's not without a hard fight. And meanwhile, while that fight's going on out here in Montgomery, you know, a new set of people who've come in, you know, the ones who always follow the power, and that's the lobbyists and the office seekers. If there's going to be a government, there's going to be power, there's going to be money, there's going to be you know, there's pork barrel, there's all sorts of stuff we can hope for. So the, the town is overrun with people who want something from the government. Leroy Pope Walker actually had a door in the back of the War Department that led out into a dark alley that he could use to leave office at the end of the day so that he could escape the throng of office seekers who are outside the front door. Poor Jefferson Davis, it was not unknown for him to come home for dinner to the Confederate White House and walk in and sit down to the table and see a complete stranger across the table from him. Someone had just walked in, sat down at his table while he's having his dinner of buttermilk and cornbread, yum yum, and try to get an office from him or a commission as an officer. The people who wanted things were everywhere. And then it all gets electrified with the firing on Fort Sumter. It's so wonderful that you all still have the winter building here today. I don't know how many of you know that. Of course, you all know the telegram from Walker to Beauregard in Charleston authorizing him to go ahead and fire on Fort Sumter was sent from the winter building. What you may not know is that a group of journalists who called themselves the Sons of the Sunny South. They they rented the room directly above the telegraph room. And there they would sit and drink wine and eat chocolate cake and have a high old time. But most of them also understood Morse code. And one of them always had an ear cocked out the window to listen for the clicking telegraph downstairs. So the first people in Montgomery to learn that Fort Sumter had been fired on was not President Davis. It was the Sons of the Sunny South in the room up above. There's euphoria. Everybody's making speeches. Montgomery goes wild with this. And Davis summons Congress back for an emergency session. And it is there that Davis says the one and only thing he is ever famous for. If Lincoln read a phone book, it would be famous today because of the way he'd have worded it. Davis didn't have the gift of memorable language. The one thing we remember him for saying is, all we ask is to be let alone. A line he stole from Alexander Stevens, who would said it several weeks earlier. Things immediately ratchet up enormously. And meanwhile, the question of whether or not Montgomery can remain capital comes up because now after the firing on Fort Sumter, Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee, Arkansas are going to come out and all of a sudden the geographical balance has shifted toward the east. And as one of the the encouragements to Virginia to secede, Davis determines to offer to move the capital to Richmond. There's tremendous debate here. A lot of the original secessionists don't trust Virginians because, well, they're too full of themselves. 
South Carolinians don't trust them, and they like the fact that they have North Carolina as a buffer between them. They think they were too slow to secede. They, they resent power going to the east. People in Montgomery don't like the idea of the Capitol moving. And meanwhile, there's a dozen, a dozen other cities in the south who've been trying to politic to get the Capitol moved to their city, including Nashville, Tennessee, at a time when Tennessee hadn't seceded yet. I like the idea of a nation's capital being in another country. That's, that's even-handed, I think. But Richmond is chosen. It's one of the last things that's voted on in the Confederate Congress, and it's one of those episodes in which one man changed the vote because of that funny business of the quorums and all that that I explained before. And all of a sudden in late May, having been a place in the eyes of the world for 112 days, Montgomery instantly goes back to just being a little spot on the map. But look at what happened here during that 112 days. They framed not one but two constitutions. They chose a president, a vice president. They got all the executive branches of government up and operating. They created a treasury. They began what would become a currency of sorts. They started foreign relations. They created a working, if rickety, government that was going to last for four years. All of this done by men who couldn't even agree with each other on what to have for dinner much of the time. It's not a great, it's, it's an example, I think, not just of what these men could do. It's a wonderful example of what Americans can do under immense pressure in trying and critical times faced with a challenge that none of them would ever have expected they would have to confront. Montgomery, fortunately, was untouched by the war. Richmond, of course, you all know what happened there. But Montgomery, and happily that means that today Montgomery has so many of these wonderful buildings and, and monuments today to remind us of what took place here now 150 years ago. And I'm delighted to see so many people here who are interested in learning a little more about what happened here in Yankee Town. Thank you very much. We now have time for questions. If you'd like to ask a question, please raise your hand and let us get a microphone to you and speak directly into the microphone. Thank you. Jack, you said uh, the movement of the capital to Richmond uh, left Montgomery sort of as a backwater. Would you speculate for just a minute about how uh, the military history of the war might have been different had Montgomery remained the capital? Did everybody hear the question? What would have happened in the war if Montgomery had remained the capital? There was tremendous opposition, of course, to, to moving the capital. Montgomery didn't want it to go. Some maintained that Richmond was too exposed because, of course, it's only 100 miles from Washington. The counter-argument is that Richmond is the major industrial city in the South. It's next to New Orleans. It's the second or third largest city. It's an economic center. And also that this is going to be a war in which the government may need to be close to the scene of action, especially if Jefferson Davis is going to lead armies, which, of course, he never thinks, thinks about doing. It was probably a smart move to take it because Virginia was going to be the major battleground. I mean, there's no way for Lincoln's armies from Washington to get anywhere in the South without going across Virginia. What would have happened if the capital had remained here? It was, of course, you know, counterfactual. What would have happened if what did happen didn't happen? <clears throat> I think the war in Virginia would have been largely the same because capital or no capital, Lincoln's armies east of the Appalachians have to go across Virginia to, to uh, subdue Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia. I don't know if there would have been the, the sort of on to Richmond focus if Montgomery was capital that there was in Virginia. It's really not until about eight, late 1862 that Lincoln realizes the objective is not cities, that the Confederacy really lives in its armies, the objective is the armies. But it's a much different thing to launch a campaign aimed at Richmond, 100 miles away from Washington, than it is to launch a campaign from anywhere in the Union across the Ohio or across the Potomac to Montgomery, several hundred miles south. I doubt if there would have been campaigns aimed at Montgomery in that instance, but how the course of the war otherwise would have been influenced, it's, it's very hard to project. I think Virginia is still going to be the major battleground in the east. Just geography dictates that. In the west, of course, where the, you know, the Confederacy was winning the war in Virginia by not losing it. You know, after four years of war, it, the armies weren't much differently placed than they were four years earlier. If the war was still going on, if it was limited to Virginia, it would still be going on today. 
you know, we'd be having the 55th Battle of Bull Run. <clears throat> you know, and Robert E. Lee would be you know, talking about, I, you know, I, I, thought I, had, I thought I had him whipped back in 36, and then Ike almost got us. And, you know, <laughs> but I think the campaigns out west, where the Union is winning from the very beginning of the war, you know, the Western Army of the Union starts in Paducah, Kentucky, and ends up in Raleigh, North Carolina. The East has become the West thanks to that army. Chances are that the focus after uh, control was taken of the Tennessee and Cumberland Rivers, the focus might then have been on Montgomery. But I, beyond that, it's anybody can come up with any scenario they want. How's that for a nice inconclusive answer? <laughs> yes, sir. You alluded to the uh, rift between Alexander Stevens and uh, Jefferson Davis. Can you elaborate on that and what effect did that have on Davis's ability to govern the executive office? Sure. Did everybody hear the question? I'll, I'll back up just a little bit. A lot of folks sort of grin when I say this, but I mean it sincerely. The Confederates' founding fathers were in some ways idealists. They thought they were going to have a new and more perfect uh, confederation. And one of the things they thought they were going to reform was the evils of partisan politics. Having left the Union behind, they would, there'd be no parties because they'd all agree. They'd have left all the sources of discontent behind them. But they're politicians, so that notion lasted about 30 seconds. And then they start politicking amongst themselves. You never have a second party. There's no Republicans and Democrats in the Confederacy. But a second opposition party does emerge. It never has a name. It's just the anti-Jefferson Davis party. It begins here thanks to the White House. Uh, a delegate from South Carolina whose name I've now forgotten objected to the Congress providing a house for the president to live in. The Constitution says he's to get $25,000 a year and no other emoluments. Well, giving him a place to live free is an emolument. And this fellow, I wish I could remember his name. He's one of the... You know, in a state full of crackpots, he's the best one for this California, uh, South, Southern California, Southern California's crackpots too, South Carolina delegation. Robert Rett immediately becomes anti-Davis because Rett didn't get to be president. Robert Toombs becomes anti-Jefferson Davis because he didn't get to be president. And Alexander Stevens becomes anti-Jefferson Davis because Davis doesn't do what Stevens tells him to do. And that starts very early. Uh, when the St Davis tries to send Stevens as an emissary to Arkansas to try to promote secession in Arkansas, and Stevens says, no, I'm not going to go. Davis will ask him time after time to do some sort of mission, and Stevens will refuse. The only time he actually agrees to do one of these missions is to go to Virginia to help persuade the Virginia Convention to um, vote to secede partially in return for getting the capital of Virginia. So Stevens is the real little giant of American politics at that time. An incredible intellect, but a deeply sort of unusual man inside. And I don't know what his motives were. But I think, he, in his case, it's largely the fact that Davis didn't follow his advice. Stevens was only about four foot six, weighed about 90 pounds. He referred to himself as a half-finished man. But he had the biggest brain in the Confederacy. And, and a big ego to go along with him, the Napoleon thing and all that. And I think that was the beginning of the breach. And then Stevens very quickly allies himself with Toombs, with Robert Rett, with some of the others who formed this Davis opposition. To the point that by 1864, even though he's sitting vice president, Stevens just goes home to Georgia, never goes back to Richmond. He just, you know, essentially says to hell with it, I'm going home. The uh, Davis opposition never has the power to stop him. Davis gets everything through Congress he wants. I think he, has, he turns in 32 vetoes and only has one of them overturned. So his opposition are essentially toothless, but they acquire a lot of noise. They, they get a lot of press, and they just create a lot of, of uh, nuisance and, and bad morale at a time that, that, that that's the last thing Davis needed. 